Connect, a laid back, no pressure way to meet people and to get connected to a life group. Saturday, August 23rd at 6 p.m. on the Brentwood campus in Hudson Hall. Sign up today at brentwoodbaptist.com slash group connect. One of the ways we connect people to Jesus Christ is through service. And one of the ways we serve is by making ourselves available to lead the church on important teams that require spiritual leadership, service mindedness, and expertise. Each of you have gifts and skills that God has provided and those gifts can be used in the church. If you would consider serving in this way, or if you know someone who has much to offer, we're currently seeking nominations from our members of Brentwood Baptist and its campuses for leadership and service teams, including trustees, the Rockbridge Foundation trustees, staff resource team, the finance ministry team, and our deacons. We need every member to prayerfully consider who among you might meet the qualifications to serve on these teams and to let us know by providing their names on the nomination form in your bulletin. You can learn more about these teams and the qualifications for each at brentwoodbaptist.com slash nominations. Thank you for your faithfulness to pray and to serve. Hi, I'm Roger Severino, the Adult Minister of Leadership, where I have the privilege of serving in leadership development and other discipling initiatives. We want to welcome you to worship this morning. If you're a first-time guest, we'd love to have a record of your visit by filling out a communication card. These are in the pew racks in front of you or in the bulletin if you're worshiping in Hudson Hall. You can use this card to update your contact information or submit a prayer request so we can be praying for you. Just drop it in the offering a little later in the service. We're so glad you're here. Now let's worship together. stand. Let's continue to worship together in this place. Sing together. In the name of the Father, 
in the name of the Son, in the name of the Spirit.
and is and is to come to him who sits on the throne aren't you glad aren't you grateful that it's God who sits on the throne today We're so grateful to be in this place today to lift our praises to him and be reminded be reminded of what we just sang that in Christ alone he's the one who provides the strength and the courage and the love and mercy and forgiveness and so much more and we acknowledge that in this place and we acknowledge that and reflect on that as we now pray together. Our pastor will come and kneel here at the front. Maybe you'd like to come and kneel as an outward ex expression of how much you adore the Lord that we're singing of this morning. Maybe you've come with someone this morning and you know that they desperately need you to pray for them and with them during this time. That's what this is all about, an opportunity to be still and be reminded who sits on the throne as we call on the name of Jesus. You may be seated. Let's pray together.
Worthy is the Lamb who was slain to receive power and wealth and wisdom and strength and honor and glory and praise. And to him who sits on the throne and to the Lamb be praise and honor and glory and power forever and ever. Gracious Father, we're so thankful in this place today that you are the one who sits on the throne. And we pause now to ask you to forgive us for placing other things on the throne in place of you. And Father, we realize that because you're on the throne, we can come to you with whatever it is that we have. With the struggles that we deal with, Lord, with the praises and offerings and thanksgiving. For you are the creator of all things and the giver of all things. So, Father, we thank you for that. For my friends in this place today, Lord, who, who walk in with heavy hearts, the things of life have not gone the way that they had hoped. I pray they would find comfort in you, Lord, and they would find strength in you. And I pray they would be reminded that you indeed still sit on the throne. So thank you for the privilege we have to worship you, to honor you with our voices and with our lives. We pray now for your spirit to have the freedom to move and work in the rest of our time that we have in this place together. We ask these things and we pray these things with gratitude. In the name of Jesus, amen. Yorkshire. That's our adult and student orchestra combined to lead us in worship today, and uh, all under the leadership of our Michael Lawrence, who does a fabulous job in doing that. It's become one of our important areas of outreach. Do you know that? As the schools have backed away from classical music training and the arts, uh, Michael has led our church in developing this um, mu musical school, the Brentwood uh, uh, School of the Arts, uh, where you can get uh, music lessons, voice lessons, instrument lessons, and then uh, he has a way of bringing you into the orchestra. Uh, he's sneaky like that. Uh, but, uh, you know, when they have their uh, end of year concert, we'll, we'll have, I think it was six, seven hundred people here. Uh, last spring to hear the to hear the concert of, of our it was, it was impressive very impressive um, <clears throat> the Lord gave the church apostles prophets preachers teachers administrators uh, all all for as he saw fit so that the body would be capable of responding to the opportunities and the challenges that it faced in its culture all of you have gifts and we're in a significant time in the history of the church because in the first reformation, uh, the Bible was given back to the people. Uh, John Wycliffe was, uh, uh, was executed, burned at the stake for translating the Bible into the vulgar language of English. And now we are returning ministry back to the people. Uh, we're now discovering in, in, in various ways about the kingdom impact that you can have in the, in the areas where God places you, where you work, where you live, where you play. And if we're going to accomplish uh, the Middle Tennessee Initiative and all that, that God is opening up for us, then you're going to be involved in ways that you haven't been before. Some of you are going to be leaders of these new campuses. You're going to be the teachers. Uh, uh, you're going to be the worship leaders. All, all those gift sets are going to come from you. Um, no way in the world will ever be able to hire all the people we need to do this, do this kind of work. And so you have an opportunity to let us know who some of these leaders are today and the information you were given. You'll find a nominating form for the trustees, uh, for the trustees of, um, of the Rockbridge Foundation, for um, the leaders of the uh, SRT, which is staff resource team, and the finance team, which we call the stewardship team. Uh, is you know who these people are better than we do. You know who uh, where their gifts are. You know the character that they exhibit. And um, 
so you let us know who these people are so we'll be able to find them and involve them in ways that they can serve the church best. And we have uh, lots and lots of opportunities. Now, um, I preached at Station Hill two weeks ago and I was told <clears throat> it's gonna be a down Sunday, everybody's going to the beach. Uh, we still had almost 600 people there on a down Sunday. Uh, last week, the church at Avenue South had 268 people show up. Two weeks before it was 203. Uh, we haven't done any advertisement yet. We just kind of word of mouth. They put out 275 chairs. They had 268 people. Uh, so Aaron will have a hard, um, big grand opening here in a couple of weeks and then go to two services. <laughs> so uh, we've had uh, the soft launch at West Franklin. They got a new sign up. Uh, we're planning now for the soft launch at Woodbine. I, I knew how long it would take to work through the decision-making process of, of Brentwood Baptist Church and how long it would, it would get. So, you know, we, we did all the legwork and we've gone from, uh, boy, Mike, this is exciting. This is, you no know, church is doing what you're doing and it's gonna be interesting to see how it works out. Let us know how we can. And I talked to all the people that, you know, plant churches and do all that kind of stuff. And everybody was, and then, then we voted and now we're two years behind just overnight. Um, what I didn't expect was a number of people who walked up to it, the number of churches that walked up to us and said, here, we want to be part of uh, Middle Tennessee Initiative. And we added Woodbine, we added West Franklin Baptist Church very quickly. What you need to know is there are four churches right now that are talking to us that want to be part of this. And we are urgently trying to figure out how we're going to find the staff people and the pastors and get them trained and get them ready so we'll be able to respond and get ahead of this curve so as, as we have opportunities then we'll be able uh, to, to, to you know strike when the iron's hot so to speak now um, the middle tennessee initiative is expensive uh, and you keep looking at me like i'm going to find a new way to fund this thing uh, that, you know, I'm going to walk up one Sunday and go, hey, we, we've invented widgets and we're going to sell a whole lot of widgets. No, no, it has always been the same. The financing of God's kingdom work has always been the same. As God blesses his people in celebration and faithfulness, they provide the resources needed for the church to respond to the opportunities and challenges before it. That's part of the testimony. Uh, in an area where it doesn't seem like you have the resources, where it doesn't seem like you'll be able to pull it off, God always provides and provides for the testimony and the witness of his people. We have the, witness, the, the resources we need to refurbish a repurposing church, to go in there and update it, to uh, get it up to code sometimes, uh, to repaint it, to fix broken windows, put the electronics in it like you need it. Uh, and those kind of things. We'll have the resources we need to put the, the leadership in place and, and to do the community ministries of, of dealing with poverty, health care, and education, all of that leading for a chance to, to share the gospel for evangelism. Now, God understands how much this cost, and he's put the resources we need in your pocket. It's through your giving, through your tithes, through your offerings, they were able to do this. I pray there'll never be a time when there'll be a gap between what God is calling us to do and the resources required to do it. So if you're joining us in Hudson Hall, you'll see the buckets on the table or near the end of the rows there in the bleachers. Of course, here in the sanctuary, the ushers will be coming forward. So let's continue to worship by our giving. Let's pray together. Receive the gifts of your children. Receive them because we, we give them in great enthusiasm, eager to see what you're going to do with everything we are, everything that we have, everything we dream. We, we give you these resources, mindful that they come from you, asking only this, that you use them in a way so that everybody knows of the good news of your son, Jesus Christ, our Savior. For it is in his name we pray. Amen. Hi, Brentwood Baptist Church family. Today I'm really honored to baptize 
Christopher Mung in this public worship service. I've known Chris for about two years. Last year, his wife, Tianping, and his son, Aaron, were baptized on Easter Sunday. Chris wrote me his own testimony in which he said that through preaching of Pastor Mike and Pastor Guo, he had heard that God is always there. All we need to do is to initiate our conversation with God. Although Chris has talked with God many times and has heard God spoke, speaking to him many times, and he has even seen God three times, but he still chose sinful and secular way of life, made mistakes, commit sins. But until last October, when he was hospitalized for a serious illness, he realized that God's love has been pouring out to him through pastor's visits and deacon's visitation. Therefore, he decided that it is the right time to commit his life to the Lord and Savior, Jesus. And today, through this public baptism, he is announcing also his commitment to his wife, son, church family. And of course, this is a testimony of his returning to the Savior, Jesus Christ. Chris, my brother, have you accepted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior? Yes, I have. Because you have believed with your heart and confessed with your mouth, I baptize you in the name of God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. Amen. On Monday afternoon, all of the pastors of our various campuses get together and we go over the text for the coming Sunday. Uh, our services are planned at least a year in advance and so we get the text and we kind of go over what, what the research says and what uh, the Greek says and this kind of thing. We bounce it around between all of us and uh, share stories. Uh, everybody on all of our campuses hears the same message from the same text. Now it is pressed through different personalities, so it feels a little different, seems a little different. But if you were to go to all of our campuses this morning, you would hear basically the same message, and you would hear the same big points emphasized. Uh, as we got together and looked over this, uh, Jay reminded me of a conversation uh, that he and I had several years ago. And he told the group that it had been one of the more important things that he had learned about having to lead a church in Williamson County. Do you remember, he said, when you said to me, Jay, you and I serve a church filled with rich young rulers. Now, I know, I know you're, going, you're going, oh, whoa, 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 wait a minute, Mike. I'm not that guy. Uh, that, that's not me. I, I'm not rich, I'm not young, and I'm not a ruler. So that leaves me out. No, it's, it's, it's not so much that. But here's the dead giveaway. When you think about your life, when you think about your career, when you think about your relationships, when you think about what you want out of life, is the first word in that sentence, I. I have plans. I have dreams. I want I desire, I'm going to work it out, I'm thinking about, is your first word I. If your first word is I, you're the rich young ruler. It's not, 
I'm seeking what Jesus wants. I believe I have found what Christ wants me to do. I'm being obedient to what, and it's not that. Your career is up to you, isn't it? Your success is up to you. And whether or not you're a winner or a loser, well, that's determined by you as well. And that's the conversation that Jesus had with the rich young ruler in Mark chapter 10. Stand with me in honor of God's word. And as he was setting out on a journey, a man ran up, knelt down before before him and asked him, good teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Why do you call me good, Jesus asked. No one is good but one, God. You know the commandments, do not murder, do not commit adultery, do not steal, do not bear false witness, do not defraud, honor your father, honor your mother. And he said to him, teacher, I've kept all of these from my youth. And then looking at him, Jesus loved him. And he said to him, you lack one thing. Go sell all that you have and give it to the poor and you will have treasure in heaven. Then, then come and follow me. He was stunned at this command. And he went away grieving because he had many possessions. And Jesus looked around and said to his disciples, how hard it is for those who have wealth to enter the kingdom of God. But the disciples were astonished at his words. And and again, Jesus said to them, children, how hard it is to enter the kingdom of God. It's easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich person to enter the kingdom of God. They were even more astonished, saying one to another, well, then who can be saved? Looking at them, Jesus said, with men it is impossible, but not with God, because all things are possible with God. And Peter began to tell him, look, we have left everything and followed after you. I assure you, Jesus said, there is no one who has left house, brothers or sisters, mother or father, children or fields because of me and the gospel who will not receive 100 times more. Now at this time, houses, brothers, sisters, mothers, and children in fields with persecutions and eternal life in the age to come. But many who are first will be last, and the last first. With men it is impossible, but not with God, because all things are possible with God. This is God's word for God's people. Hear it, believe it, and live. Let's pray together. Just like you waited on that young man's response, you now wait on ours. Same question, same demand. We pray, Father, we'll have the courage this morning to give this story a different, a different, a different ending. And we pray this in your name. Amen. Now, if we were in a different tradition, one of my associate pastors would be standing about right here with a podium and the open Bible, and he would read a handful of words, and when he got to a certain part, I would stop him. Whoa, whoa, wait a minute. And then I would teach And then I would tell him to pick it up again, and he would read some more, and I would stop him. And we would do the entire sermon with this conversation, him reading, me responding, him reading, me responding. Uh, Some of you may have been in churches like that, where where that was the way that the sermon was preached. It's very theatrical. Boy, it helps you pay attention, keeps you engaged. And, 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 you know, you almost want to preach this sermon this way. There's, you know, every time there's a phrase, you want to stop and go, wait, wait, are you paying attention? Do you see what's going on here? From the very beginning, are you paying attention? Do you see what Mark is doing? The 10th chapter of Mark is right in front of the 11th chapter. Okay? Now, why is that important? Because from the 11th chapter on, that's about the last week of Jesus' life. There are 16 chapters in Mark's gospel, 11 through 16, are about Jesus coming to Jerusalem uh, with a triumphant entry. It's about uh, that last week of Jesus' life onto the crucifixion through the resurrection. So Mark is trying to get a whole lot of Jesus stories in this last chapter. And, he, and he, now he gives us the story of the, of the rich young ruler. And it's put in here to help you understand the cost of discipleship before Jesus shows us the cost in the crucifixion. Now, are you paying attention? 
First thing, Jesus was on a journey. Jesus was on a journey. A lot of stories with Jesus begin with him on the move. As I tell you before, we serve a Jesus who will not stay where you put it. Jesus is always on the move. Jesus was going through Jericho when he had the conversation with Zacchaeus. Zacchaeus had that moment to respond when Jesus stopped and said, are you coming down so I can go home and have lunch with you? Now, had Zacchaeus hesitated, Jesus would have kept on. He wouldn't have waited. You and I have this, have this kind of feeling that Jesus is sitting in the outer office waiting for us to invite him into our inner office so we can have a conversation. Jesus was sent to you, to me. He wasn't summoned by us. He was sent. He's not waiting for a meeting. He's calling the meeting. Jesus is on the move. If he comes close to you, you'd better jump in line and jump in line in a hurry. He won't wait. Good teacher. <laughs> code word, code word, code word. Did you hear it? Rabbi. Teacher. Most of the time, people call Jesus rabbi, teacher. It's one of the, the, the most known stories that we have, uh, the, uh, names that, that, that Jesus is called in the stories about him. Um, but it's always a mark of an unbeliever. Teacher. I, teacher. Rabbi. I'm going to listen to what you say, but I'm necessar not necessarily going to obey it. I, I, I'm going to hear what you tell me, but that doesn't commit me to or obligate me to follow it. I, I believe you're wise, but I'm going to make the final decision. See, as I explained to you before, most of us have a board of directors in our head. Uh, and, and, and this board of directors are important people. Sometimes our parents are there, sometimes you know, significant teachers, coaches, uh, books we've read, that kind of all part of the board of directors. And of course, Jesus has a seat at the table. And we want to hear what Jesus says. And so when we get in a situation, we'll say, Jesus, what's your opinion? Uh, somebody slaps you. So you turn to Jesus. What would you think we should do, Jesus? And Jesus says, somebody hits you on one side of the head, turn the other. We say, that's interesting, Jesus. Then we turn to another member and say, well, Cleanius Wood, what would you do in this situation? We want to hear what you're saying. We'll balance the, the two, but we will make the final decision. Rabbi, teacher, some of you will say, well, Jesus is a good teacher. You're not paying attention. When you say that, it tells me you have not read one thing that Jesus has said. The claims he made about himself, the claims that he taught us, the things that he demands of us are so outrageous that either you listen to everything Jesus says or you listen to nothing. He is Lord or he's a nut. There is no middle ground. He didn't leave us any. Teacher, what do I have to do? My life is controlled by me. I'm going to do something that would therefore obligate you, Jesus, to respond to me. What do I have to do so that I inherit eternal life? What do I have to do so that you then owe me eternal life? I'm going to fulfill obligation X, therefore you will owe me and my eternal life will be a fair exchange. Some of us think that way, don't we? That Jesus is really lucky to have us on his side. You know the commandments. And he listed them. The man responds. I've kept these since I was a kid. Interesting. Jesus doesn't challenge him. Interesting. Jesus doesn't say, nah, no, you haven't. Do you remember the day? You remember how Jesus redefined the, uh, the, the, the commandments and the Sermon on the Mount? You've heard it said before. You've heard it said before, thou shalt not murder. But I say to you, if you have anger in your heart toward your brother, if you've already made the decision that you would kill them, if you have the chance, then you have crossed the line, you've committed the crime. 
You've heard it said before, you should not commit adultery. But I say to you, if you've already made the decision in your heart, you would have that relationship with her, with him. If you have the chance, then you've already crossed the line. You've already committed the crime. Jesus doesn't say that to this guy. He lets it stand. Jesus recognizes that as far as this young man knew, he was telling Jesus the truth. I have kept these. I have done what was asked of me. And Jesus loved him. If you had been there, you would have seen it in his face. There are, there are a handful of very, very tender moments of the gospel where Jesus' love for somebody is very, very real. Um, the conversation he has with Peter, where he walks up to Peter and says, Satan has desired you that he may sift your life, but I have prayed for you that your faith won't fail. Can you imagine being Peter, looking into the face of Jesus, having Jesus say to you, I have prayed for you that your faith won't fail. Now in this moment, Jesus loves this guy, and the guy knows it. You lack one thing, one thing. Ah, oh, you're going to tell me 99 out of 100 is not bad, Mike. Nine out of 10 is not bad. I only missed one. It doesn't matter if the one you miss is the only one that counts the only one that matters. Sell everything you have, give it to the poor, then come and follow me. And you can see the guy doing math in his head. If I sell my house, I'll get this much money. If I sell my cattle, I get this much money. If I sell my automobiles, I get this much money. If I sell my house at the lake, house at the beach, if I sell my resource, if I totally divest myself of everything I own, this is how much liquid cash I will end up with. And he's doing the math in his head. And he comes up with that total. And he comes up with it real fast. And he says, this is what it will cost in dollars and cents for me to come. And it was too much. Too much. He didn't come. I know you want to say, I don't have that much stuff. I'm not rich. Yes, you are. You're loaded. Now, I, I know you want to pull out your, your, your 10W40 here, your 1040, and say, hey, this is, this is how much I made. Well, at least that's what I told IRS I made. We won't get into that. That's another sermon. Uh, our refrigerator in our kitchen went out on July 4th. It was repaired last Friday. For over a month, we did not have a refrigerator in our kitchen. Now, like many of you, we have an extra one in the garage that we store extra stuff. Okay? So we had a refrigerator. But you had to walk all the way to the garage <laughs> to get ice for your glass. You know, most drinks don't taste half bad, lukewarm. It's not bad. <laughs> all the way to the garage. Got a, got a refrigerator? You're rich. Got two? You're loaded. Got a car? You're rich. Got two? You're loaded. Got a house. You're rich. Got a bedroom. A bedroom where you can sleep in one room and the kids sleep in another. Mansion. 
You got a television? You rich? You got two? Loaded. Doing the math in your head, aren't you? If I give up everything, this is what I would cost. This is what I would have to let go of. Do you realize that this guy got the same invitation that Peter and James, Andrew and John got? Do you mean so it's almost verbatim? Almost verbatim. You've been fishermen. I will make you fishers of men. Come, leave your nets, leave your boats, come and follow me. Leave everything, come and follow me. It's almost the same invitation. This guy was invited to be the 13th disciple. The same invitation that Peter got, same invitation Andrew, James, and John got, this guy got. And he didn't come. Paul in Philippians 3 says, I had all of that. I had the academic credentials. I had the successful career. I was the guy that everybody was watching. I had all of that. And I threw it away because the only thing I want to know in my life is Jesus Christ and the glory of his resurrection and the power of his crucifixion. Everything else is garbage. Amen. That's what Paul said. That's not what this guy said. And he walked away and Jesus led him. Jesus led him. Now you expect the next verse to be, and Jesus ran after him. Jesus went and got him and go, hey, fella, you need to think about this. This is serious. You don't know what's at stake, but Jesus doesn't. He lets him walk away. Now, a lot of you have made decisions, and you thought there'd be thunder, lightning. Maybe the ground would shake, but nothing happened. Jesus let you walk away. He'll let you live with your decision. He'll let you die with your decision. He won't chase you. He'll let you walk away. This freaked the disciples out. Jesus turns to them and says, it is very, very hard for the rich to get into heaven. Very, very hard. This makes the disciples nervous. One, they wanted what this guy had. After all, this guy was successful. This guy had it. After all, isn't that, isn't that the way that we know that God loves you? She gives you a bunch of stuff. He loved Abraham. Abraham had a bunch of stuff. He had cattle. He had oxen. He had sheep. He had slaves. He had wives. He had all this stuff. Why? Because they list it in scriptures. He loved David. David had all of this stuff. Well, that's the way you know, isn't it? That's the way you know. If you really, really love Jesus, he gives you new stuff. And sometimes when you get new stuff, you kind of celebrate Jesus really loves me. Look at my stuff. But you and I know some people with some stuff that Jesus can't love. You know who they are. And that messes your theology all up, doesn't it? How can people that mean, how can people that hateful, how can people that evil still have all that nice stuff? The disciples wanted to be this guy. When you come into your kingdom, Lord, can I sit on one side and my brother sit on the other side? Will we get our stuff then? Jesus said it's hard to get into the kingdom. Did you see what he said? Nope, he didn't pay attention to it, did you? Did you see what he left out? He went from his heart for the wealth that he'd get into the kingdom of God. Then he said it's hard for anybody to get into the kingdom. Then he goes on to say the wealthy is harder than the, getting a camel through the eye of a needle. Now we have people who have stayed up late at night and studied these things and they think they have found a gate that was called the eye of the needle. It was a security gate in the walls of Jerusalem. It was a little, little bitty gate kind of uh, shaped like a triangle that a loaded camel could not get through walking straight up. The camel had to get down on its all fours and kind of shimmy through that gate. And that, that's what people say, ah, it's not, it's not impossible, not, but it, it's just, just really, really hard. That's a great story. It has nothing to do with this passage. Okay, that's not what Jesus is saying. Jesus is saying, take a needle. Find the eye of that needle. 
the eye of the needle that you and I can't put a thread through without having our glasses on. Now you hold that eye of that needle up to the nose of that camel. When that camel gets sucked through the eye of that needle and comes to the other side, then you'll be able to make it to heaven all by yourself. That's what Jesus is saying. As soon as that camel goes through the eye of that needle, then you'll be able to do this all by yourself. Until then, you're not going to make it. Nobody. What are we going to do? Do Does it ring a bell what Jesus says here? With men, these things are impossible. But with God, all things are possible. It's the same thing that Gabriel said to Mary. How am I going to have the Christ child inside of me? How, how is this going to happen? With this kind of stuff, Gabriel says, it's impossible for human, for human beings, for, for, for man. It is possible with God. All things are possible with God. How in the world are people like us going to have the living Christ in us? It's impossible with humanity. It is possible with God. Now, I know you're looking at that word impossible, and you're thinking, well, if I just work hard, because I do impossible things all the time. The difficult I can do today, impossible, that take a little longer, right? Okay, let me translate this to redneck ease. Okay, I'm going to just lay it down here so you'll get it. With men, it ain't going to happen. Okay, now I know you're sitting there thinking, well, Mike, maybe if I, nope, not going to happen. Not going to happen. Now, that plan, it won't work either. That plan won't work. That plan, no, no, ain't going to happen. Get that through your head. Now, I know you're thinking, well, man, if I can end up with 99 things out of 100, that's an A. Not with God's standard. It's an F. When the one thing you're missing is the one thing that really matters. You know, flunk making a 99. Good teacher. Good compared to what? Are you good enough compared to what? See, we're, we're, look, we're used to saying this and looking up and down the road, going, well, I'm as good as that guy. That guy. We always compare ourselves to an axe murderer. We never compare ourselves to Billy Graham. It's always an axe murderer. Well, at least I didn't do what he did. But the comparison is to Christ, not to each other. Good is a relative term. It always depends on what you're referring to, not each other. But to the Lord Jesus, not are you good, are you good enough? And the answer to that is no. That's what the rich young ruler found out. And just like Jesus stood in front of him and waited for his response, he now stands in front of you and waits for your response. I know you're doing the math in your head. Be very, very, very careful. Jesus will let you live with your choice. He will let you die with your decision. Let's pray together. You're thinking to yourself, if I can just get this changed, if I can just work this out, if I can just know, it's impossible. You won't ever work hard enough. You won't ever be good enough. Not by yourself. So it begins in this moment of giving up, surrendering, of of understanding that what you have broken, you cannot fix. What you have done, you cannot undo. What you have said, you cannot unsay. But Jesus died for those sins. He died for those mistakes. 
And that by receiving that forgiveness and by confessing him as Lord and Savior, it will open up a life for you that the rich young ruler never ever found out about it. And he's waiting. Just like he waited for the rich young ruler, right where you are, as the church waits for you from where you come. Now we're waiting for you back in the park. It's a comfortable room, open room. We can sit down. We can answer you questions. We can pray with you. We can talk about this most important decision. For some of you, it's as easy as becoming a member of the Brentwood Baptist family. We'd love to get you connected. For others of you, you just need somebody to pray with you. Life's just been tough this week. We understand that. Whatever it is now, the Lord is waiting for you where you are as the church waits for you now as you come. Lord Jesus, with every life open before you, every heart, I pray that the choices that are now made are exactly what you want. And we pray this in your name. Let's sing these great words together. All to Jesus I surrender. All to Him I freely give. I will ever love and trust Him. His presence daily live. I surrender all. I surrender all. All to Thee, my blessed Savior, I surrender. Jesus, I surrender. 